Uh, welcome to this uh, Lee Kuan Yew School panel and book launch. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this book launch of this book on the UN uh, Security Council. Uh, as usual, I'll make uh, three quick points uh, before the discussion uh, begins. The first point is to have a brief commercial about the school, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School, because some of you may, may be coming for the first time, you know. And I want to mention that uh, we are the third best endowed school of public policy in the world, the second most generous school of public policy in the world. We have uh, scholarships chasing students uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School. And uh, we are also, in some ways, the first school in the world in terms of having a very uh, innovative, multidisciplinary curriculum. Uh, I, I mention all this because the mission of our school actually is to help improve governance in Asia and beyond. So only 20% of our students come from Singapore, and we try the, rest, the remaining 80% come from the rest of the world, from uh, Southeast Asia, China, India, and, and the rest of the world. So you know, as you know, recently the Schwarzman Scholarship Schemes, they had 3,000 people applying for 111 scholarships. We give more than that in the Lee Kuan Yew School, so uh, please pass the word around uh, about our school. The second point, a quick point about the uh, topic of our discussion, which is the UN Security Council. And of course, this is, this is, uh, this, what's remarkable is how few people know that the UN Security Council is by far the most powerful international organization in the world. Uh, it's, it's the only international organization, as far as I know, which, like James Bond, 007, has a license to kill. So, if it makes a decision, it can declare wars. And as you know, wars have been fought with the authorization uh, of the UN Security Council. And what makes it even more powerful is that even very large countries have to obey the diktats of the UN Security Council. So, uh, so for example, when sanctions are imposed, uh, whether you like the sanctions or you dislike the sanctions, you have to implement them. And what's remarkable is the track record of the, the, how the uh, 193 countries, including the, uh, I guess, is it still 193, right? Uh, 193 minus 5, including the 188 who are not permanent members of the Security Council, still obey the instructions of the UN Security Council. And that's why this is a very significant uh, subject for discussion. And the third and final point I'm going to make is to quickly introduce the, the speakers and uh, the hero uh, of today basically is the man sitting on my life, uh, on my left, uh, Sebastian von Einsiedel, uh, because number one, he's one of the three editors of this volume, and number two, he arrived at 2 a.m. from New York. So a special round of applause for Sebastian. <laughs> Uh, and he's awake so far. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I give you just a quick word. Uh, Sebastian has been the director of the United Nations University Center for Policy Research since its inception in 2014. Before that, he was with the Policy Planning Union of the UN Department of Political Affairs and many other things, including the time he spent. Uh, and we all got to know each other in New York when he was with the International Peace uh, Academy. Now the second point I'm going to make about this panel that's remarkable about this panel is that among the four of us, three of us have offices in this very small campus in Bukitima. As you know, Simon Chesterman, the Dean of the Law Faculty, uh, he occupies the upper quad, which looks down the lower quad where we are. <laughs> in every <laughs> sense. <laughs> and then we have Francesco Mancini, who also, like Simon and, 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 and Sebastian, also was, spent some time in New York with the International Peace uh, uh, Academy Institute, I guess it was called, Academy Institute. Institute. And now he's an adjunct professor uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, of Public Policy. So this is why it's such a pleasure for us to host a discussion uh, on the world's most powerful organization. It's a remarkable coincidence that you have so much expertise on this organization in such a little corner 
uh, of Singapore. And this is what we hope to share with you today. So each speaker, uh, I kept my time limit of five minutes. Each speaker will speak for 10 minutes each. Uh, starting with Sebastian, I'll say something at the end and then we'll throw the floor open uh, for questions. So Sebastian, over to you. In early 2015, uh, when this book was going into post-production, the publisher, Lynn Reiner, got in touch with me and my two co-editors, David Malone and Bruno Stagno Ugarte, and said, guys, you need to think about the new title. UN Security Council in the 21st century is boring. Sex it up. Come up with something new. So we stuck our heads together and turned to the world of movies for inspiration. So among the proposals we came up with was securitize this for Robert De Niro fans, um, or uh, Snow White and the 14 Dwarfs, um, a, a reference to the current ambassador Samantha Powers more than her predecessor Susan Rice. And uh, the final um, offer we, we, we provided was um, Frozen 2. Uh, probably the most fitting one. And unsurprisingly, uh, Lynn Reiner didn't bite, so we got stuck with Security Council in the 21st century. And in many ways, it's actually an apt title because it capt captures um, key trends in the Security Council uh, in about the last 15 years since the turn of the millennium. And indeed, much of what drives and preoccupies the Council today can be um, traced back to a number of developments and events that date around the year 2000 and that make the council today a very different one from the council uh, uh, 15 years ago. First of all, starting in 1999, the resurgence of UN peacekeeping uh, leading to an almost tenfold increase of deployed troops, um, all the way up to 106,000 now. And in parallel, the increase of the, um, of the protection of civilians agenda, which also leads to a more frequent use of force by, by peacekeepers. Um, second, uh, in, in the year 2000, you had the adoption of seminal thematic resolutions on um, HIV AIDS, and on women, peace and security, which gave rise to um, the Council's increasing preoccupation with thematic agenda items that now take up quite a bit of the Council's time. Third, the 9-11 attacks and um, following that the rise of the counterterrorism agenda on the Council, which interestingly has become a unifying force among the Council's permanent members, the so-called P5, but often a source of controversy between the permanent five on the one hand and the rest of the membership um, on issues such as council overreach and human rights. Fourth, the responsibility to protect report, which actually came out just a few weeks after 9-11, was initially overshadowed by the global war on terror, but then was resurrected, um, uh, unanimously endorsed by the UN membership in 2005, um, but the application of which in specific cases remains hugely contested uh, among member states. Fifth, the creation of the International Criminal Court in 2002, and the powers of the Council to refer and defer cases, which has become um, an, an increasingly a feature on a number of um, uh, Council agenda items. And finally, the Iraq War in 2003, which caused deep scars at the UN that uh, continue to reverberate to this very day. And one way or another, all these different developments uh, um, play out in a more recent um, development, and that is the uh, rise, the return of east-west tensions uh, in the Security Council that have given rise to concerns about return of Cold War paralysis. And we see, we see the main manifestation of that in the increase of the use of the veto, in particular by Russia and China. You all have heard about the four double vetoes on Syria by Russia and China, but also double vetoes on Zimbabwe and Myanmar, as well as loan vetoes, meaning only Russia vetoing um, on Ukraine, um, Georgia, and Srebrenica. Now, all this is all these tensions in the Council is all the more remarkable 
as only four, five, six years ago, um, we seemed to enter a golden period of Security Council activism with the arrival of the Obama administration in 2009 and its um, its promise to return to multilateralism, um, its promotion of, um, uh, of a reset with Russia, its courting of China, and its, clear like its greater interest in ending old wars rather than starting new ones. And initially Obama's approach uh, uh, seemed to pay off. You got strengthened sanctions against North Korea and Iran, and I think there's a strong argument to be made that you wouldn't have gotten the Iran deal, Iran nuclear agreement of last year absent those sanctions. And you also got Beijing's and Moscow's consent for the use of force under the banner of responsibility to protect not only in Libya but also Cote d'Ivoire. But as we all know, things went downhill from there. Um, starting with the acrimony over how NATO implemented the, um, the Libya mandate, um, followed by deadlock over Syria, and then reaching um, a, a low point with the Ukraine crisis. And much of that, especially in New York, has been attributed simply to a backlash over Libya. But I think this um, is too narrow a view for a number of reasons. Um, first, because of a, a set of wider motivations for Russia to block on Syria. Um, uh, a general longer-term backlash by um, Russia and China against what they saw as a Western agenda to, to undermine the principle of sovereignty. Next, the Arab Spring, which turned the Council's uh, attention towards a region where interests of uh, the Permanent Five clash rather than coincide. Um, next, China's dramatic economic increase, which means it now has interests um, in, in parts of the world um, that it didn't have to defend 10, 15 years ago. And finally, a reorientation of Russian foreign policy with the um, return of uh, Putin to the Russian presidency and, um, and his approach of a, a much more muscular foreign policy towards the West. Now, while I don't want to downplay the Council's malaise, we're still far away from a new Cold War. Um, Russia and China do not constitute a voting bloc. They actually differ on quite a number of, of situations. China overall is showing a rather constructive approach on, on a number of files, in particular on peacekeeping, but not only on peacekeeping. Um, and it's remarkable. Council members have maintained, the P5 in particular, this remarkable ability to compartmentalize. Clash on one issue and then meet two hours later on a different agenda item and agree. Now, most importantly, the P5 um, continue to share an interest in maintaining the Security Council as a functioning body on, on issues on which they have shared interests. And there are three big ones among them. Number one, the counterterrorism agenda, um, on, on, on which the P5, in spite of all the tension, continue to adopt rather far-reaching resolutions to this very day. Number two, um, crisis management, Syria notwithstanding, um, in, 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 in the context of civil wars, in particular in, in Africa, although we do see a little bit of spillover of P5 tension on a number of files, including Burundi. And finally, non-proliferation. Um, as you know, the P5 are also the five official nuclear weapon states, um, and they have a shared interest of keeping that club quite exclusive. Now, finally, very last point, all the focus um, on the tensions um, among the P5 tends to um, overshadow the fact that in the day-to-day -day work of the Council, the division that matters most is between the permanent five on the one hand and the ten elected Council member on the other. It's difficult to overstate the degree to which the permanent five dominate the Council's agenda, and this has only gotten worse over the past 10-15 years. Kishore, if you think it was bad during your time, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, don't return uh, uh, now. Um, and this has to do with the phenomenon of the penholdership. The permanent five now claim 
to hold the pen on the drafting of council resolutions of almost all <coughs> country specific files, which means that the E10 are largely uh, marginalized. So let me end with a, with a somewhat cynical uh, note of hope. Um, for all the divisions we see um, in the council, you may be heartened by the fact that the um, P5 show very strong solidarity in fighting off any effort to weaken their grip on power in the council. Thanks so much. Wow. Uh, I had never seen anyone cover so much ground in 9 minutes 30 seconds. <laughs> That's very impressive, Sebastian. By the way, I also want to announce to Gaddafi and Hidayat that we have about 20 seats in front here. So just keep pushing people in front. Uh, there's a lot of space here. So uh, I think next uh, on my list, uh, we have uh, Francesco. And you have exactly 9 minutes 59 seconds. <laughs> okay, just, just one second. Thank you very much, Kishore. Um, now, when I posted on social media that I wrote a chapter on the Security Council role in promoting demo uh, democracy, I got two types of, of replies. One was a pretty short chapter, isn't it? <laughs> and the second one was it must be a damning chapter. Well, it turned out it is neither. And, and uh, let me tell you why. And in doing that, I also want to say a few words on the Council approach to conflict resolution, broadly speaking, because there is a substantive overlap between the promotion of democracy and the overall uh, way the Council address um, conflict resolution and peace building agendas. And of course, as a recent uh, member of the LKY school family, I'm happily embracing our Dean's rule of always keeping our speeches to three points. <laughs> so I organized my speech in three questions. First question, how does the, the council promote democracy? Well, as many uh, as many you know, the word democracy uh, is does not appear in the UN Charter. And it is uh, still relatively controversial in the context of the UN uh, by some member states who claims that it is a small screen for Western countries to pursue their interest and influence. Yet, since the end of the Cold War, the UN Security Council has continuously, or for not consistently, promoted democracy as the basis for governance and for conflict resolution in countries on its agenda. How does it do that? First of all, through peacekeeping missions and peace building missions, which are political missions that have no troops, which include mandates to reform, for example, police and army, to hold elections. The list includes many countries. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Burundi, Central African Republic, the DRC, El Salvador, Haiti, Nicaragua, and so on and so forth. In the last 15 years, 16 out of the, six of the 19 peacekeeping operations include the mandates calling for election and or democratic reform. Second two, sanctions. 10% of the council sanction regime have had their objective to restore an elected government or to coerce warring parties to respect democratically elected governments. Places like Haiti, Angola, but also in Sierra Leone, in DRC, and more recently in Cote d'Ivoire and Libya. Three, transitional administrations. These are the cases in which the UN becomes the transitional government in a country, as it happened in Cambodia to a lesser extent in 1992 and to a much larger extent in Kosovo and in East Timor since 1999. And finally, democracy promotion also happened through the Council's calls in the form of presidential statements or press releases for free and fair election, for acceptance of election results, and for development of democratic institutions. Now, you've noticed that these tools which are also the conflict management tools of the, of the Council, have become, over time, more intrusive. Indeed, this is part of a broader trend in the, conflict, conflict, in the Council conflict management approach of the last two decades. The Council has increasingly demanded to warring parties not only to end a conflict, but also to implement reforms and put in place political and governance arrangements. And democracy promotion is part of this trend. Second question, how does the Council promote, sorry, why does the Council promote democracy? Those who look into consistency in the Council will be inevitably disappointed. 
The Council is a political organ. <laughs> Member states prefer to leave their option open and to deliberate case by case. Therefore, the Council's promotion of democracy is not the result of an overarching strategy. It's rather the product of a combination of three factors. First, there is what I, I call a normative factor. The acceptance of democratic institution as a legitimate counterpart in international relations. And the belief that democratic regimes are more peaceful and stable. Second reason is what I uh, call a strategic factor. Promoting democracy is an exit strategy in post-conflict countries. So the pragmatic need to identify an agreed upon measure, generally election, for disengagement from post-conflict countries. And finally, there is a political factor represented by the Council tendency to accommodate multiple agendas of member states. Peacekeeping mission today includes up to 300 different functions. So democracy promotion becomes yet another item on this laundry list. Now, I think that these factors have produced a rather idiosyncratic engagement with democracy promotion, characterized by this case-by-case -case decision making rather than a comprehensive and coherent st strategy, which incidentally has been undermining the Council's capacity to manage and resolve conflict as well. Third question, what are the challenges in promoting democracy? Well, I think we can at least identify three of them. First, the challenge is time. Democratization requires social transformation that happen over a generation time period. And generally, the council engagement does not cover that time. Even missions that end up to stay in the country 10 to 15 years is still a very short time in the life of institution of a country. The second challenge relates to promoting democracy from the outside. This sort of optimistic assumption that an international community could engineer political and social transformation in other countries. I think it is fair to say that peacekeeping can help to foster democracy by providing stability. But this external presence is also unaccountable politically and can cry out the indigenous attempt to build democracy and institutions. In the case of transitional administration, where, as I said, the UN act as a temporary government, Fundamental dilemmas exist that there is an, an inherent contradiction between attempting to establish the condition of a legitimate government and what actually Dean Chesterman called in one of his books, You the People, a benevolent foreign autocracy, basically. The means are not consistent with the ends. And the third challenge is the Council's strong emphasis on pushing for free and fair elections. This, I think, is a problem. Of course, it is evident that holding election does not mean that a democracy has been established. The Council repeatedly pushed for election with very unrealistic timelines. So, for example, countries like Cambodia and El Salvador end up to be on the same timeline, uh, or thought the latter had formal democratic institution in place. And it did it again very recently in certain African Republic. It does it with Libya. And we also know that pushing for quick elections can backfire. We have seen the rise of election-related violence in countries like Afghanistan, Cote d'Ivoire, and Iraq. So in conclusion, I believe that the Council remains a useful tool of conference resolution, but is hardly sufficient. And all the trends that Sebastian just mentioned, to which I would add a backlash from the US-driven freedom agenda in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also what he mentioned, the turmoil in the Middle East, the Russian assertiveness, and so on and so, so forth, we all make conference resolution a more fragmented activity. The Council will continue to face questions about its relevance and its less than stellar track record in conference resolution. On the other hand, it seems safe to argue that the Council will continue to uphold democracy and in particular election as part of its conference resolution approach. And this mainly because after two decades of practice, the perspective of holding election has become a central element in the conference resolution strategy of the Council. Successful electoral processes today provide an indicator to measure the degree of stability in a country and signal to the Council member the possibility of becoming, of, 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 in, of um, starting an exit strategy. Nobody has seriously challenged these assumptions so far, and the division among member states and the existence of other priorities among member states will guarantee for this trend to continue. Thank you.
Brilliant. Uh, you did nine minutes, five seconds. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> this is getting better and better. <laughs> Simon's going to top it over, do it in three minutes. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> no, before Simon. I want to announce, by the way, that this is a fascinating presentation, and uh, I know that we won't have much time in Q&A. Do think of questions, but after Q&A, we have actually organized a reception uh, since Sebastian flew all the way from New York. The least you could do is offer him a glass of wine after this. So do hang around for more Q&A, uh, even after the, the discussion here. So Simon, you also have uh, 10 minutes. So you, you figure they'll only stay through my remarks if they know there's a promise of wine <laughs> afterwards. <That's very> <laughs> I was afraid you'd start meeting when a lawyer starts speaking. <laughs> so as, as Kishore said in the opening, the Security Council is one of the most important entities on the planet. Uh, certainly in terms of global governance, it has more teeth than any organisation uh, that has ever been created. And it's important to keep in mind as we think about change that this was only possible because of the global catastrophe that was the Second World War. Uh, and really it's only in these times of crisis that you can create organisations like this. Um, Sebastian has highlighted, I think, the, the evolving context within which the Security Council now, op now operates, what we might loosely call the post-Cold post War order uh, or, or other forms. And I'm glad you highlighted the role of China where uh, it's, it's fascinating that at the moment the member of the P5, so the US, UK, France, China, Russia, the member of the P5 with the most peacekeepers and civilian police deployed is China. Uh, which is not something that most people would expect. Um, the other thing that I think comes out of Sebastian's remarks is that one of the problems that the UN has always had, and the Security Council has had in particular, is the management of expectations. That during the Cold War, no one expected it to do anything. And so when it helped resolve the Iran-Iraq war, this is remarkable. Uh, then after the end of the Cold War, there's the expectation that the UN can be everything to everyone, and for a few years you had a massive expansion of peacekeeping, uh, and then it was the 18 Americans who died in Somalia that led to a massive rollback of the Security Council. 9-11, the threat of counterterrorism, counterproliferation is on the agenda, the Security Council rises again, uh, and then periodically comes back in. So I think the management of expectations is something to keep in mind. That, if you like, is the strategic environment, or the geostrategic environment, uh, and then Francesco, I think, has highlighted uh, the evolving changes of what's required on the ground and the rise of democratization in particular. But as he pointed out, democracy doesn't appear in the UN Charter, uh, nor, however, does the word peacekeeping. And so what I'd like to talk about is how, within the UN, the dynamic of the relationship between the Security Council and one of the other important entities, in my case, the, the Secretary General, uh, has affected the way the Council's operations have changed. So I'll talk mainly about the Secretary General and the hook, if you like, is the fact that there's now uh, a rush to work out who's going to succeed Ban Ki-moon. His term finishes at the end of 2016 um, and there's now a rush and, and one of the most interesting races to succeed him. Uh, it's not obviously as interesting as the American political system. There's not quite the incandescent incoherence of people like George, uh, of, uh, Donald Trump and, uh, and Bernie Sanders. But for UN observers, it's one of the most interesting races we've ever had. Uh, and it's interestingly more transparent and more interesting than past races. Uh, there's going to be a lot more debate. Um, but going back to something Sebastian said, uh, one of the interesting things that has tended to unify the permanent five members of the Council is any attempt to undermine its, their prerogatives, uh, and that's certainly true in terms of the selection of the Secretary General. So we're seeing slow movements in the direction of transparency and participation, but I wouldn't hold your breath for too much. Um, this is interesting partly because in the past campaigning to become Secretary General was frowned on. The very first Secretary General, Trig Lee, uh, a Norwegian Labour lawyer, found out that he'd been selected when essentially he was informed that he was being appointed Secretary General. Uh, and it's only in the past few decades uh, that campaigning has become uh, more common. Today we have five official declared candidates. We have a UN website on which uh, their bios are available, uh, which is a big improvement from 10 years ago when many of us were still in New York, and it was really up to a think tank like the International Peace Academy, what's now the International Peace Institute, to organise a forum for the candidates to speak. And I was a fringe member of that process and knew that Ban Ki-moon had a very good chance of winning when he came and presented to an informal grouping of NGOs, academics and others and said absolutely nothing. <laughs> Which was very smart because none of you have a vote. 
And he knew, as we really did, that the decisions were being made not in New York, heaven forbid, not in the NGO community, the decisions were being made in Moscow, Berlin, London, Paris, and most importantly, Washington, D.C. Um, so although the Secretary General serves all humanity, he or she is the world's diplomat, um, his or her, and I think we can probably say with a degree of confidence, her relationship with the Security Council in many ways defines the success or failure of the Secretary General's role. If the Secretary General and the Security Council can agree on a strategy and that strategy is realistic, then there's a, there is a chance, there's no guarantee, but there's a chance the UN can do some good. Uh, if they can't agree, then it's certain that the UN will fail. So I'll talk a bit about the Secretary General, and in deference to Kishore, I'll also make three points about how the Council can be the SG's best friend, worst enemy, but also the site of his or her most influence. So in terms of being a friend, as an ally, the Secretary General can be given extraordinary powers by the Security Council. Many of the things that Francesco talked about in terms of the mandate have been entrusted to the Secretary General uh, and the representatives of the Secretary General. These fall broadly into baskets of responsibility for military operations, overseeing sanctions regimes uh, and special political type of missions. In military terms, the Secretary General is the nominal Commander-in-Chief of over 100,000 peacekeepers. I say nominal because typically they operate under national contingents, even when they're wearing blue helmets. But the Secretary General has an important role to play in defining the, the scope of the, the peacekeeping operation. The sanctions regimes have been touched on. The Secretary General and the Secretariat have a very important role overseeing sanctions. Um, in the past quarter century especially, these have expanded uh, broadly into situations in which the UN Security Council is trying to contain a conflict uh, or compel a, a group of people or a, a country to do or stop doing certain things. Uh, in rare circumstances, the Secretary General has even been given a trigger function. Um, I think one of the best examples of this is Haiti, where the Secretary General was sent into a negotiation with the power to report back to the Council, and if he reported back saying, no, they're not working, the negotiations aren't producing the result we wanted, then sanctions would automatically kick in. That's extremely rare for the Secretary General to be given that kind of executive authority, uh, but he or she still has significant power to oversee the implementation of sanctions. And then political missions have become even more complicated, ranging from good offices and mediation in a variety of circumstances to even running entire territories, as the Secretary General essentially did in Kosovo uh, and Timor-Leste. Where things tend to break down uh, is when the Council's mandate to the, to the Secretary General is either broad but vague, as it was, for example, in post-conflict Iraq, or where words are not matched by resources, as they were not, for example, most prominently prior to the genocide in Rwanda. So when the Secretary General and the Security Council work together, the Secretary General gets enormous power. Uh, the Secretary, Secretary General, though, usually needs to be quite deferential to the Council, because when it turns against him, that's kind of the end of his role. Uh, such deference to the Security Council might occasionally seem craven, but one can sympathise with the SG's desire not to make an enemy of the Security Council. Uh, and this is partly because of the way in which he or she is appointed. Um, although the UN Charter states that the Secretary General is appointed by the General Assembly on the recommendation of the Security Council, in the entire history of the UN, the Security Council has only ever recommended one candidate, and the General Assembly has always appointed that candidate. So in practice, that means the Security Council appoints the Secretary General, and what that in turn means is that the permanent five members have a veto over whoever gets appointed. Now, it's a wonderful bit of, of UN trivia that the, the votes for the Secretary General are secret. So how do you do a secret ballot with Security Council members with permanent status and therefore vetoes? Easy. The P5 have different coloured ballot papers. So the P5 get to have their red ballot papers, the other have white, white ballot papers, and in this way the, uh, the P5 maintain their veto. So if you're an aspiring Secretary General, you've got to make sure that you haven't recently offended members of the P5, uh, and ideally you want them to vote uh, in, in favour of you. This is hardly a mechanism geared towards selecting the best candidate, rather it seems to be geared towards a lowest common denominator of choosing a modest person who's not going to offend anyone. And in practice, basically, that's what's happened. Probably the two best secretaries general were appointed by accident. Doug Hammarskjöld was an obscure foreign, uh, cabinet member of uh, the Swedish government who got appointed with no expectation that he would become one of the greatest secretaries general we've had. He's the one who invented peacekeeping, by the way. Kofi Annan 
uh, was appointed after Butros Ghali was essentially sacked by the United States, and he was initially regarded as America's man. He'd been friendly and helpful to the United States, particularly in Bosnia, uh, and it was therefore something of a shock when he ends up being a very good Secretary General, a very ambitious Secretary General, who champions the responsibility to protect that Sebastian mentioned, uh, that uh, champions the Millennium Development Goals and calls the US war in Iraq illegal. So, you don't want to be the enemy of the Security Council, and yet the Security Council can also be the main source of power for the Secretary General, because he or she has really only one one arrow in his quiver, which sounds very innocuous but ends up being very important, and on this I'll conclude. And that is Article 99 of the UN Charter, which gives the Secretary, Secretary General the power to bring to the attention of the Security Council matters which, in his, in his opinion, may threaten international peace and security. It sounds very vague, but it's actually the basis for an independent political role for the Secretary General. And although it means that he can't force the Security Council to do anything, in rare circumstances it means he can embarrass them into not doing anything at all. Thank you. You're the only one to exceed 10 minutes. <laughs> By five seconds. <laughs> okay, I, I, I tell you, I'll speak for eight minutes so we can start at uh, six o'clock sharp, the Q&A. So start preparing your questions. I want to mention to you that my chapter in this book is about uh, UN Security Council reform, which I think is a very critical challenge uh, for the Security Council. Because one reason why the United Nations survived and the League of Nations died is because the great powers were given a stake in the UN by being given veto powers in the UN Security Council. So the reason why the UN has survived for so long is because the great powers enjoy the veto powers that they have and so they keep the United Nations going rather than to kill it as they did with the League of Nations. But of course, for it to work, you got to make sure that you have the great powers of today or, or tomorrow in the UN Security Council and not the great powers of yesterday. And that's a problem we have in the UN Security Council because the five permanent members were selected because they won World War II in 1945. 71 years have gone by. Clearly, it's time to change. And so the UN set up something called the UN Open-Ended Working Group on Security Council Reform. I think in 1991 or 1992, uh, 23, 24 years have gone by. So someone suggested let us change the name of the working group from open and from open-ended working group on Security Council reform to never-ending working group on Security Council reform. So the purpose of my remarks today, is, as usual, in three points, is to explain why Security Council reform has not happened. Secondly, why I think it will happen in due course, and finally, how it will happen. Now, why has it not happened? And yeah, I think Sebastian described it brilliantly. The P5 can fight each other ferociously on lots of things, but when it comes to the veto privileges, there's total unanimity. So whenever a UN P5 member stands up and he says, we are in favor of Security Council reform, we would love to see Japan and India become permanent members, don't believe a word. <laughs> it's not true. None of them mean it. They're very happy with the situation. And fortunately, the P5 don't have to kill uh, the new aspirant states because for every new member that wants to join there's a neighbor that says why not me so if Brazil wants to join Argentina says why not me so if Japan wants to join South Korea says why not me India wants to join Pakistan says why not me but the most brilliant uh, intervention was made by the <coughs> Italian ambassador uh, to the UN, Paolo Fulci, who when everybody was pushing for Japan and Germany to become permanent members, he said, he got so angry, he stood up and said, why are you pushing for Japan and Germany? We Italy, we lost World War II also. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm telling you this to illustrate how the gridlock works in the UN. So, that's why it has not happened. So, why will it happen? And I think it will happen 
one day, suddenly, uh, in some ways, accidentally, when the P5 wake up and realize that people are challenging the credibility of the Security Council, at some point in time, it is inevitable that some countries will begin saying, why is it that just because you won World War II in 1945, I should obey what you say today in 2016? And by the way, it can happen. And in one case, it actually did happen. Huh? When, once when the UN Security Council imposed sanctions on Libya when Gaddafi was running it, the Organization of African Unity thought that was completely unfair, unjustified, and the OAU more or less announced, we're not going to impose these sanctions. I think that was the most largest case of defiance of the Security Council mandate, and the Security Council wisely realized that this was unwise, so they quietly backtracked and realized that at the end of the day, if the countries of the world don't obey you, there's nothing you can do about it. And frankly, it is conceivable that the day could come when a major country, and the most obvious example would be India, and says, you know, I have 1.3, 1.4 billion people. I have absolutely no say in this. Why should I comply with you? And if a few major powers begin to say that, then, the, then it will be an existential crisis for the Security Council, and to preserve its credibility, it will have to change its composition. And so when it comes to changing its composition, how will it happen? So this is why I came up with something called a 777 formula. What does 777 stand for? Seven permanent members who represent the great powers of tomorrow and not of yesterday. Seven semi-permanent members, and I'll explain why we need semi-permanent members. And seven elected members. Now the seven permanent members I propose for the great powers of tomorrow, of course the United States, Russia and China will remain. I suggest that since Europe has a common security and foreign policy, we give Europe a permanent membership and take away that from UK and France. And then we give the three new votes to the most populous countries in Asia, namely India, in Africa, namely Nigeria, and in Latin America, namely Brazil. So these are the seven permanent members. And then you have seven semi-permanent members chosen from the next 28 states. And why do I suggest semi-permanent members? Because as I mentioned, for every new member that wants to come in, there's a neighbor that says, why not me? All the why not me's become semi-permanent members. So every four terms, they come back automatically as a member of the UN Security Council. So they win something also. So in a sense, the middle powers also that have a stake in the Security Council. And then, of course, the seven last seven members are the elected members, and it's very important that you get all the remaining, give the other remaining member states a chance to serve on the Security Council, because the elected members in many ways provide the legitimacy for what happens in the UN uh, Security Council. So, someday, I hope they'll wake up and they'll realize that you know we really need a Security Council for the, as the book says, for the 21st century, and therefore they'll wake up and say, we'll choose the 777 formula, and you heard it all here first. Thank you very much. <laughs>